All right. Hey, what are you doing? <laughs> Aaron? <laughs> so, uh, as, as, as yesterday, you have up to 11, uh, more or less, uh, okay. for the presentation, the discussion, and the question. All right. So, so what plenty of time. Need. Yeah. Ready? Yeah, All right. That's nice. Thank so, you. Uh, thanks for being here, folks. Uh, we're stoked about to talk about this topic. It's something that uh, Stuart and I spend lots of time talking about outside of work, if you know we ever actually do that <laughs> outside of work thing. So uh, I'm Aaron Halfaker. I'm a principal research scientist at the Wikimedia Foundation. I study the behavioral dynamics of people on Wikipedia and try and build technologies for them. Um, and I'm Stuart Geiger. I am a staff ethnographer at the University of California at Berkeley's Institute for Data Science. Um, originally sort of a qualitative ethnographer by training, but I do a lot of work studying um, all, Wikipedia, but also other systems of knowledge production, including um, open science and open source software development for science. So Stuart and I work together a lot. Um, in fact, I, like, I was just looking through, and Google Scholar believes that we've published nine papers together, although Stuart and I debate what constitutes a paper. If it's in Google Scholar and it counts towards your age index, I think that it counts. <laughs> um, but we, we kind of come from these different uh, backgrounds. So I have a PhD in computer science. I specialize in quantitative methods, and I do a lot of system building as part of my research practice. Uh, and I picked up a lot of quantitative social psych along the way in order to understand the systems that I'm building. I like to say things that all, all, uh, all that matters can be measured, um, which goes against the common phrase that uh, not all that matters can be measured and not all that can be measured matters. I disagree. I do believe that not all, like it's, it's hard to figure out measures, but we can measure anything that matters and that people find numbers convincing. Um, and my background is originally from the humanities. I was sort of an undergraduate in uh, philosophy and then did a master's in cultural studies and communication. And then did my PhD at the information school at the University of California, Berkeley, um, sort of in information management. And I definitely come from sort of the more kind of organizational and sociological sort of side of that. Um, and my background, right, is tra core training in qualitative methods, including interviews and ethnography. Um, did a lot of work on sort of trace ethnography. Um, and sort of how we sort of think about the role of, of online and archived data in qualitative and ethnographic practice. Um, I also have a sort of strong background in, in critical theory and uh, sort of understanding and then sort of fields of, of science and technology sites. And uh, one of the things I would say is sort of the data are not truth, uh, data are people. Uh, data are also plural, not singular, but, um, and that people find stories con uh, compelling. All right, so we're gonna go through a few topics today. One of the things that we thought we would really take advantage of is talking about the history of Wikisim, I, I mean OpenSim, uh, because we originally met at uh, Wikisim in 2009, um, and kind of give you a view of how we've seen the field change since then. Um, we'll also talk about how we've been coming together on methods over the course of the last nine years. <laughs> And, and finally, we want to give you a particular story about how, we, uh, how we've seen the lack of mixed methods result in bad research, and then the use of mixed methods uh, allow us to do better research, or at least respond to what we think is, is not the right way of thinking about things. Okay. <laughs> so this is a screenshot from Wikipedia in 2009, uh, 2008, 2009. It's actually when sort of Aaron and I first met at uh, at uh, then Wikisim, um, and yeah, you can see Wikipedia hasn't maybe changed, or go back a little, hasn't changed all that much. I think two million articles in English. Um, the corners are square instead of rounded. Um, but actually, sort of, I think when we first uh, sort of showed up to Wikisim, we were sort of reminiscing. I think we both had this uh, sort of as graduate students. It was sort of one of our, our first conferences, and we sort of had this idea when we came in that. All the kind of important and interesting work on Wikipedia had already been done. We had sort of missed the mark, right? Yeah. There was a whole bunch of landmark papers that had been published. And you know, like I actually had uh, somebody in my lab, Reed Protorsky, who was a senior graduate student at the time, actually warned me that don't get into Wikipedia research. Wikipedia research is on the downswing. Yeah. Um, and so this was this was a kind of a concern at the time. Was you know like maybe maybe nobody would want to publish Wikipedia papers anymore. Um, you know, and you know, I've got to ask too. So in Wikisim 2009, we were in the uh, the Contemporary Resort in uh, Disney World, 
Anybody know whose idea that was? I think that that was awful. It was so it was so crazy to like get on the the bus with with people in in mouse ears heading to go on rides and that sort of stuff with our badge and and collared shirt and you know just very very unusual experience. I, I found it ethnographically fascinating. I loved it. Um, yeah, it was a very interesting place to hold the conference and sort of co-located with Uppsala as well. And I remember that was one of the first times that I attended. That was the first time I attended any uh, ACM or computer science conference. Um, I had sort of previously attended conferences sort of on the more sort of humanities, philosophy, and communication side of things. Um, but it was a really, it was my first time sort of actually to go in and sort of uh, present my own sort of research findings to a new community. And I was sort of, uh, people were very receptive and open. Uh, and it was sort of a really great experience for me as a graduate student. So. Yeah, and same for me. That was, that was my first conference. I remember actually pacing up and down the, the hallway outside of the presentation rooms, making sure that I had my presentation down. Uh, I was not pacing outside the hallway working on this presentation. <laughs> oh yeah, and so uh, during the same time, the, so that it wasn't presented at uh, Wikisim, uh, but there was this seminal paper that came out about Wikipedia by Bawan Sa and his collaborators at Palo Alto Research Center. The singularity is not near. This paper showed a really, really concerning thing about what was happening in Wikipedia. I mean, at the time, Wikipedia was kind of a utopia. It was magical. It was amazing that it worked. And all the questions were, why is this working so amazing? But what they saw in the study was that if you looked at the population of people editing Wikipedia, there was, there was exponential growth, but it suddenly stopped in 2007. And no one quite had any idea why. But the debate was sort of between, uh, is this bad? Or is this not a bad thing? Yeah, there was a lot of, I remember like at Wikisim 2009, that was sort of the talk of, I think that paper came out in 2008, and that was sort of the talk of everything at the conference. And it was actually really great to have um, you know, so many people who were sort of dedicated to um, the study of, uh, sort of, of Wikis sort of wrestle over all these kind of alternative hypotheses, like was the encyclopedia simply right-sizing? You know, have we sort of just run out of topics to write about? Was there just not enough work to do? Um, or were sort of just people sort of worse off than they were you know, back in the good old days? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it cer I mean, it certainly seems that some substantial shift had happened. People really wanted to know what it was, and so hypotheses were flying around everywhere. You know, and I suppose I should mention, too, especially since we're going to get into the quant qual thing, that at this time I was presenting a paper at this conference that had a little tiny bit of social psychology, but generally it was a giant regression paper. And then I met this, this interesting guy in the poster session who was like, wow, we should look at bots. And at the time, he was kind of kooky. You know, it's kind of weird now to say that, wow, we should look at bots because bots and bot research is so prevalent. But at the time, I, I think it was just Stuart who was waving that flag. Yeah, and I think that that was one of the things that the, the, that poster that I presented at Wikisim 2009 was actually one of my first forays into, my first entry points into uh, quantitative methods. I had actually um, adapted the use of a PHP-based bot that had its source script published that was used for recent changes patrolling that I was, run, you know, I was running on my desktop computer for a week to just sort of scrape the recent changes feed. This is sort of way back, sort of before, you know, um, and sort of finding that sort of a high, sort of a much larger proportion of edits made to Wikipedia um, were bots, so sort of 15 to 20 percent, um, compared to sort of previous work that sort of found, to sort of, sort of said, well, we can sort of dismiss bots, they're only maybe 2 percent of all edits, and we're really interested in humans. And so if people talked about bots at all, they talked about it as a way of data cleaning. We need to remove the bots from our data set if we're answering questions about humans. And I sort of came in and sort of had this sort of weird philosophical sort of uh, approach based on some sort of weird French, French philosophy of actor network theory and saying, no, we need to understand these sort of uh, computational agents as people too, because um, actually people are behind them. I'd like to point out, though, that that 20% number was very convincing. <laughs> um, so this, this kind of led Stuart and I to our first uh, collaboration working together. So the, the Wikimedia Foundation, the company behind Wikipedia, uh, was looking at these trends in the data, both their own studies and the study by Bawan Sa et al. Um, and they, they were really concerned about this. So what they ended up doing was looking for all the people who were actively studying Wikipedia at the time. And those of you who are professors know that you barely have time to do your own work, let alone go work for the Wikimedia Foundation for a while. But you can send your graduate students. And so that's exactly what happened. I think that there were, were there eight of us total? Nine of us. Nine of us. Yeah. That the Wikimedia Foundation pulled in from all over the world, different disciplines, everything from computer science to whatever it is that Stuart calls his field. 
It's a good question. Philosophy, <laughs> humanities <laughs> studies, critical theory, I'm not quite all sure. All of the above. Um, you know, and uh, we were all sort of tasked with like trying to figure out what exactly is going on in Wikipedia with, with maybe kind of a focus on this transition point that happened in 2007 to kind of answer the question, is this good, is it bad, and what is really going on? And one of the things that was sort of really striking about that is that, you know, we, we had this very multidisciplinary team that sort of worked together, but we also had, I think for the first time, um, this sort of they were trying out giving access to the computational resources of, uh, you know, of, of, of the servers and the databases uh, to researchers as well. And so we were sort of the pilot for that. And I remember the sort of giddiness of a lot of the quantitative researchers around being able to get access to the sort of live replication databases. Um, and that was sort of also sort of my first entry point into that. Sort of now that's been massively expanded and made public. You can go to things like uh, the, the Cori project that sort of UB Canada created, something where you can sort of right now without any permission with a, just a Wikimedia account, log in and run uh, SQL database queries directly against the database. Um, to that point, that was something that was incredibly new. Right, you know, and so, so I mean, when I was coming into this, I had a background in computer science, and so I had spent a lot of time on large scale data analysis. So at the time, if you wanted to analyze any data from Wikipedia or any mini wiki wiki, what you would do is you would download this hundreds of gigabyte sized compressed XML database dump. And you would write a streaming XML parser. Who here has written a streaming XML parser? So not many people in the room, and you should feel thankful because they are horrendous. They're incredibly difficult to debug. They are a source of ridiculous spaghetti code. And so essentially what I would do is I would write the streaming XML processor. It would streamingly decompress these large files, which by the way were something like 10 terabytes if you decompress them. So you had to, you had to decompress them in place and immediately throw away the data, otherwise it would fill up any hard disk that you had at the time. And then I would load it into my own database that was sort of looked like a replica of MediaWiki's databases. It had a page table and a revision table and a user table and that sort of stuff. And at best, I could do analyses on a subset of the things that you could now get in two seconds. Uh, and it would be, at best, 30 days behind, probably more like 60 days or maybe even half a year behind. So today, it's kind of amazing that you can really just go to a website. You can log in with your Wikipedia account and say, select whatever I want from the revision table joined with the page table joined with the category links table and get a really quick answer to your question. This is sort of what we were experiencing when we first got to the Wikimedia Foundation. We were for the first time sitting in front of a, an SQL prompt and able to run a query against production data. And we geeked Drop out like tables. crazy. <laughs> <laughs> no, with the replication, they were, we, we they had were no right, right access. <laughs> so they were about two seconds delayed. <laughs> and I think one of the, the really interesting things about that is if you think about it, it wasn't just good from a sort of quantitative point of view, but from a mixed methods point of view. I was, I was coming into this largely as a qualitative ethnographer, someone who does interviews and participant observation, a little bit of survey work. Um, I had done a lot of work on quality control and vandal fighting and new page patrolling. I had sort of worked as a vandal fighter using some of the semi-automated tools like Huggle um, to sort of do that sort of new page patrolling work sitting on the IRC channels. And one of the things that sort of Aaron and I were sort of literally sitting next to each other, and I would be sort of telling him about certain things about how um, new page patrollers or sort of vandal fighters work, and then he would sort of like get a light in his eyes and be like, I think I can measure that at scale. And then we would go back and forth between different kinds of metrics where, I was, where he was trying to capture quantitatively the things that I had seen uh, qualitatively. Uh, and so it was, it was this really nice feedback loop of like taking a hypothesis that I wouldn't have come up with uh, because I didn't do that much work on the ground actually interacting with the patrolling tools or, or exploring newcomer activities in Wikipedia. Uh, that's something that Stuart could bring very easily because of ex his experience as a qualitative researcher. You know, I could turn around with these SQL queries and answer questions really fast. Go from uh, operationalizing these, these kind of grand notions that exist in Wikipedia but had heretofore not been quantified. Oops. Oh, good. It's still hung on. Um, <laughs> Oh no! Oh, I forgot that picture. <laughs> oh, this was, I was going to show you such a cool picture. So we, we actually had a wall at the Wikimedia Foundation that we just filled with graphs. <laughs> and this is sort of its own story because the person who is managing our team we organized that for another time. Yeah, <laughs> uh, really, really wanted to see quantitative data, specifically graphs over time, so we filled an entire wall with graphs. But it was also a really good way to sort of iteratively sort of have uh, present, present sort of our findings in progress. We were, we were documenting them both physically at the Wikimedia Foundation, uh, that's the one, 
um, yeah. but also sort of on the meta on on, on you know meta.wikimedia.org, the meta wiki, right? And we sort of made use of sort of this now very common standard in which uh, you put your research projects up on Meta, and then the research, and then the uh, the volunteer editing community and sort of staff of the Wikimedia Foundation can sort of engage in it. You sort of put up sort of uh, your research questions and put up some preliminary sort of data or findings, and sort of we were sort of engaging in that sort of back and forth sort of uh, sort of process with a lot of different people. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So eventually this turned into a paper that, you know, to toot our, our horn is one of the more seminal works on Wikipedia, the rise and decline of an open collaboration system. This paper describes what was going on behind that sudden transition, why it happened, what the social, sort of social dynamics that uh, were in Wikipedia that led up to it, and how it showed that this decline is a bad thing from lots of points of view, um, and how it's actually going to be a very difficult problem for us to tackle. This is definitely a piece of work that I couldn't have done by myself. You know, it was, it's highly quantitative in how it presents results, and it's highly qualitative in how it pr uh, approaches asking the questions that it does. So we do some really scary things in this paper. Like we talk about the point of view of newcomers. We talk about why patrollers are jerks without trying to be jerks. And we talk about how the whole system of Wikipedia has sort of resisted changes from newcomers over this time. And that was one of the things that, um, you know, the operationalization of concepts, right, the defining, it was very easy to sort of put up a whole bunch of charts and graphs that would sort of show some things, and, um, but sort of interpreting what those charts and graphs mean is a different story. And I think that was one of the things that both the editing community and the Wikimedia Foundation and other sort of researchers were really struggling over. There were sort of many, uh, I was actually very, very, this, this paper sort of made me very anxious uh, when, it, when we were sort of releasing it because we were you know, definitively taking a kind of stand on a controversial issue that had deep implications for the future of where Wikipedia internally should go and also the role of the Wikimedia Foundation. And sort of one, for example, one of the things, one of the sort of hypotheses um, was that, sort of, so one of the quant things we found quantitatively was that um, the rejection rates of newcomers had been going up and the retention rates of newcomers had been dropping and those things sort of uh, you know, were, were, were uh, linked very, very strongly. And one of the uh, sort, of, uh, sort of responses that we got was that, well, you know, newcomers are just worse than they, than they were back in the good old days. When I joined Wikipedia in 2004, you know, newcomer, you know, we were all sort of well-intentioned and we were sort of, uh, you know, we knew what we were doing. Now the people who join, you know, they just want to, you know, their, their motivation, you know, a whole bunch of kind of whole theories of, of sort of that. And one of the things that sort of we had that we ended up doing is this sort of large sort of qualitative coding of um, newcomers' first contributions, um, getting some, both us and some Wikipedian editors involved in sort of looking at over sort of various periods, um, based on Wikipedia's policies at the time, were their contributions, you know, on a sort of ordinal sort of scale, of sort of were they the worst of the worst to the best of the best. And we found that even if you filled, even if you just looked at the, we sort of called them, you know, good faith golden, that if they were, you know, making sort of stellar contributions, we only look at that, then we can also see that their rejection rates had been increasing and their retention rates had been decreasing. And then specifically link that to the rise of sort of semi-automated tools, um, like Kevin sort of referred to uh, yesterday in, in his keynote. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so like, I, I think a key point of this is that we, we really wouldn't have been able to approach these subjects, or at least approach them fairly, if we hadn't done this mixture of quantitative and qualitative work. The quantitative work let us talk about this problem of scale, because you can't really talk about the history of Wikipedia without dealing with hundreds of terabytes of data. But you also can't uh, talk about Wikipedia without understanding the context in which people are working. What, an, what does an edit mean? And how, how have the edits of newcomers and the patrollers who are interacting with them been changing over time? Um, we, could have, we could have made some really wrong assumptions about this, but because we spent a lot of time actually working with the data by hand um, and working with the tools that we were critiquing, we had a deeper understanding of what it was that we were measuring. And so, for example, one of the things about ethnography is that we sort of really try to sort of achieve sort of empathy. We try to sort of put ourselves in the shoes of other people. And I think one thing that we was a real struggle with this is sort of, um, we sort of did place a lot of the sort of uh, emphasis on the work of uh, vandal fighters and new page patrollers um, for sort of rejecting a lot of sort of, you know, high quality work of, of, of newcomers. But we also sort of really, you know, in a lot of the sort of time that I've spent sort of in that space, so we didn't want to sort of place the, you know, we understood the broader context 
of why that had occurred, about how, why Wikipedia, starting in 2006, 2007, really needed to focus on quality, was sort of facing this um, you know, deep existential crisis, was being called out in the mainstream media, University professors were talking about banning Wikipedia, not just sort of as a casual sort of source to look up, but sort of, you know, not, you know that, 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 that sort of whole issue, uh, really sort of discouraging it. Op-eds were sort of written, and so Wikipedia moved into this defense mode for very sort of important reasons, and to understand that the tools that were created, that we do attribute the decline to in substantial uh, proportion, um, were tools that were, need, were needed at the time, were very important, and if we, were, if we stopped using those tools, um, if we sort of told the vandal fighters to sort of stop doing their job, the quality of Wikipedia would plummet and the encyclopedia would, would potentially collapse. Right. It's, their, it's their, through their hard and brilliant work that Wikipedia survived in the first place and through an accidental effect that a problem was caused. There's certainly no blame to throw around there. In fact, we still to this day work with uh, people who build these tools that are that are implicated as causing this problem, and they're wonderful people, and thankfully they don't hate us for critiquing their work. Um, so, <laughs> I added the six papers later. <laughs> <laughs> I originally had seven there, but we debated about how many papers we've written together. We debate a lot about what a thing is. Uh. <laughs> yeah, it turns out that that's that's what humanities people do a lot. Um, so now we really want to talk to you about a paper that's much more recent. And a paper, this, this story starts with a paper that wasn't written by us. This is a paper that came out of the Oxford Internet Institute. I think it was published, was it two years ago? In 20, 2015, 2016? 2017, early 20, 20, late 2016, early 2017, I think. Yeah. Um, we should be careful, but we, we try to be correct about these things. Right. <laughs> um, so titled, Even Good Bots Fight in Wikipedia. And I, I want to use the media coverage uh, of this paper to help you understand what the conclusions of this paper are. Um, so these are some articles that showed up in The Guardian and Wired. At the bottom I have uh, BBC Newsnight. Um, essentially what this bot claimed to show was that, or what this bot, what this paper claimed to show is that bots are constantly getting into fights in Wikipedia. That it's an incredible source of inefficiency in the project. And all of this happens because Wikipedia has no effective governance mechanisms for regulating how bots work with each other. And so bots are sort of just accidentally undoing each other all the time. Getting into the, in the, in the paper, they claim to find cases of bot bot rebirth where the same bots were um, getting into conflict with each other and use that word conflict in, in various, various ways, um, disagreeing over the content of encyclopedia articles sometimes for uh, years at a time without anyone noticing. That was sort of the claim that was made in the paper. So I don't know if we're going to get audio, and I, it'll be OK if we don't. Um, oh, it sounds like we're going to. <laughs> but I want to show you a little bit of what uh, showed up on BBC Newsnight. Uh, because this is, you know, like it shows you what actually made it to the media about this paper. Oh, what? <laughs> Robots battling for supremacy makes a great spectacle. Terror hurts in trouble now! But on the internet, other, less dramatic battles are taking place between not robots, but bots. <laughs> this code back here is actually some code for editing Wikipedia. Form just a few hundred lines of computer code. They are digital minions set to work to do a specific task. They're used extensively on Wikipedia to do mindless grunt work. There is a lot of dead people in work that we don't want to do. We don't want to check the spelling of every word that, that you are. Yeah, so I won't, I won't uh, uh, bore you with the, the uh, ongoing show that uh, went on BBC, but they continue to say about how bots are causing these huge problems in Wikipedia, how this has huge implications for how people design algorithmic governance systems, and how it's a surprising problem that we should be thankful that these researchers have surfaced for us. Um, so I want to tell you a story. Oh, oh yeah, sorry, thank you. Um, I want to tell you a story from this point of view, a story about the darkest period in Wikipedia's robot history. So between March 5th and 25th of 2013, an automated software agent called AdBot committed the most aggressive bot-on-bot -bot revert conflict event ever recorded. In a flurry of inefficiency and inefficacy, 
AdBot reverted almost 15,000 contributions, sorry, 150,000 contributions other bots have made to English Wikipedia. It removed links between different language versions of Wikipedia articles, which had been automatically curated and updated by dozens of different bots for years. During a 20-day rampage, the bot annihilated their work and the work of their maintainers. The fact that such a massively destructive act could take place without being stopped is evidence that Wikipedia had failed to govern bot behaviors and that bots in Wikipedia are out of control. So the problem is that with a this... Quotation or is that you? Sorry? Is that a quotation from someone? Uh, so that's reading? a quotation from our paper refuting this. Your paper. So this is, this, is, this is what you would determine about one of the biggest bot-on-bot -bot revert conflict events if you operationalize the data the way that the Even Good Bots Fight paper does. Um, but it turns out that this is not a very good way of looking at the world. It's a very actually quite bad way of looking at the world from, from our point of view. And so, uh, and so one of the things that, you know, when I read this paper, I have done a lot of extensive qualitative work on the governance structures of Wikipedia bots, on the bot approval group, um, and sort of the way that the Wikipedia community actually comes to decide a lot of its policies and issues over controversies around bots. Um, and so this is not to say that sort of bots you know, don't get into co conflicts with each other. Um, and bot developers certainly get into conflicts with each other. And bot developers get into sort of conflicts with non-developers about what bots should be made. Um, this is actually a very important part of Wikipedia. It's a part of its sort of policy-making sort of system. And I've done a lot of extensive sort of qualitative uh, and ethnographic and historical work on the bot policies and other sort of aspects of that. One thing that this, uh, that sort of, ad, sort of ad bot did um, is, is that sort of that, 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 that story that we told about, you know, that we about from that perspective, 150,000, there was cases where AdBot did revert 150,000 edits by other bots. Um, but, what, what, but if you take a look and you understand what those revert events were within the context of Wikipedia's sort of uh, system, they were fully approved edits. Yeah. Um, and in fact, they were approved by the bot, bot, by the bot approvals group. There were sort of Wikipedia has a whole set of sort of like a committee that uh, sort of reviews bot, uh, uh, you know, uh, bot um, proposals and debates them. This is the proposal for AdBot. And what AdBot was doing, it was removing work that was um, now now made irrelevant. It was sort of removing interlanguage links. So for those of you who sort of work with sort of that Wikipedia data, you might know that sort of because of the new Wikidata project. Um, inner wiki links used to be, these are links between um, w uh, uh, pages in different language versions of Wikipedia. So before they used to be stored in the plain text of articles themselves in a way that, you know, so the um, article about, you know, the United States would sort of have an inner wiki link to, you know, hundreds of different other sort of pages um, in raw wiki markup. With the Wikidata project, those were sort of managed centrally through uh, this sort of really cool sort of data, uh, you know, database structure, and those inner wiki links became irrelevant, and so they, so AdBot was, was, was created to remove that content. Um, it, and it ended up sort of a lot of those, those links had been added by other bots. And so by the definition, if we're sort of imagining sort of bot, bot reverts as a computationally detectable event, um, this is a sort of massive, you know, the, our sort of story that we, we told in the opening of our sort of rebuttal paper was um, one way to look at it. But if you understand the broader sort of social context of this, this should not be understood as conflict, but as, actually is a really good case of a bot developer going to the community and saying, I have a, I have a simple menial task that will take humans far too long to do. Um, we need to sort of uh, update a massive change across all language versions of Wikipedia at scale. And here's how I'm going to do it. Here's the source code. Here's how I'm going to sort of manage it. Um, and you know, can I please have permission to do it? Right. You know, like this is like it, it's really important to, to hammer down. Well, this is the biggest revert event of bots ever. Um, it's also one of the best examples of a, a well-maintained, a well-approved bot. So not only did AdBot and AdShore, the maintainer behind AdBot, go through the approval process on English Wikipedia, but he actually went through an approval process on every language Wikipedia. This is a page that AdShore maintains, and it's really hard to see this table, but every single line in this table is a different language Wikipedia, and the columns are helping to track uh, whether the bot has been approved and whether it's been run yet. So it's actually really carefully, publicly documented and maintained. It was doing exactly what the community wanted at the rate that the community expected it with the approval of the communities involved. Um, and so, 
originally, when when that that paper first came out, and BBC and Wired and uh, and these other news outlets were starting to report on this, Stuart and I started to get phone calls from journalists uh, asking because we we tend to write about uh, robots and Wikipedia a lot. There was this really interesting paper about robots fighting each other, and so the journalists wanted to know. Is this paper any good? Can you talk about this? Is this interesting? Actually, they didn't ask if it was any good. They just wanted some quotes. Right, They right. assumed that it was good. It came from Oxford. And, and so uh, trying to be responsible researchers, we, of course, started doing analyses, started looking at examples, trying to figure out, like, could this paper possibly be right? And in the course of running these analyses so that we could help explain to these reporters what was actually going on in Wikipedia, we were essentially doing the groundwork for writing a paper. So eventually we decided, OK, let's fine. Let's just write a paper about it. And so we published this paper, Operationalizing Conflict Between Automated Software Agents and Wikipedia, in CCW last year. Well, actually, it'll, it still has yet to come up because CCW is on a weird cycle thing. Um, it's in the digital library and the PDFs on Wikimedia Commons. So. And uh, specifically to, to show how there are better ways of operationalizing this data, better ways of understanding what was going on. And I forget the actual figure, but it was something like 99 point high number percent uh, of the reverts between bots and Wikipedia are not really good to think of as conflict. They're, they're arguably just bots doing exactly what they're supposed to do, and, and in many times collaborating with each other, not getting in conflict with each other at all. Well, and one of the reasons I'll sort of also say that, um, you know, and, and the, 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 the one thing that, that the paper does, and we spend a lot of time, we don't sort of give one definitive answer. We don't, and Aaron keeps, he's been, we, we provide interpretation, as you've been asking sort of for like the one sort of percentage number, and I think one of the things that that we do in that paper, um, and so I've to do sort of very, very carefully, is to say, based on your different assumptions about what you think conflict is and what it means to have conflict between bots, and even that goes into the idea of like, what is a bot? And is a bot sort of just a collection of source code, or is a bot also sort of its maintainer and its operator, um, or the sort of approval process around that? Um, what do we sort of mean by bot conflict? Do we understand, so for example, a lot of the cases that we found, um, you know, and so actually when I, when, I ran, when I saw the Even Good Bots paper come out, after having done you know, almost sort of you know, 10 years of being sort of embedded in the Wikipedia community specifically around bots, I thought to myself, either I have missed and all of Wikipedia bot operators have missed something massive. And the research. Because it's not just us. Oh yeah, it's a there, whole bunch of other people have also studied researchers these. that have been looking at bots and automation in Wikipedia. All of us have missed this. Yeah, that or you know, there's something with this definition of how you sort of computationally sort of define conflict. And so, for example, you, we, we sort of have left it open as a sort of question. Um, so we, we did, we, there, there are sort of a number of notable cases where bot developers went rogue. Right? They had a pre-approved bot for a case, and they violated their approval. They used their bot account to do something that was not approved. And in violation of policy, they sort of, sort of used their technocratic authority to sort of enforce you know, something that they believe uh, should happen. Um, these are these are sort of events that stick in the minds of Wikipedians. These are deeply controversial events. Um, the banning of beta command, for example, and the ARBCOM case over that is a is a con is a conflict that sort of is a bot bot conflict because then a whole bunch of bots had to be created to undo that unapproved bot's work. Um, but also, what about cases where there were two bots that sort of because of a bug they ended up sort of accidentally overriding each other and sort of. Um, that's also a case where you could understand that as bot bot conflict, um, in which they were sort of sort of. Uh, but but to what extent we sort of attribute terms like you know very human terms like disagreement or conflict, um, you know uh, you know to this sort of weird kind of automated agent or this sort of assemblage of a human operator and an automated sort of agent um, is something that we need to sort of think of very carefully. And I think social science is really good at helping us understand. Um, you know, uh, understand what our assumptions are, and if we sort of have our assumptions, how do we then sort of you know operationalize that into sort of a quantitative measure? So we present actually a couple of different ways of thinking about conflict. And if you think about conflict between bots in one way, the figure is is is, is one percent. But basically, no matter how you do it, it's at least over ninety eight percent of cases of bot bot reverts um, are not what we would consider in any way to be conflict. You know, when I pulled this up on the screen while Stuart was talking, this is. Uh, this is a section of the lamest edit wars page on Wikipedia. It turns out Wikipedians love to document their own stuff. And so I highly recommend this page. It's very cool. This is just the section for robot wars in the lamest edit wars page on Wikipedia. Um, and it has many of these examples. 
of bots just sometimes undoing, accidentally undoing each other's work, or bot developers actually getting in fights with each other or fights with the community, that sort of stuff. And I think that's one of the things, and so before we go to the next one, yeah, I think that's one of the things that was most important and, and about sort of the paper and the way that the sort of authors sort of have, have framed it um, and sort of have talked about it sort of in other sort of you know, presentations and sort of discussions in the mainstream media um, is that all the cases that sort of we identified and that we found had been previously discovered by Wikipedia bot developers themselves who identified the fact that their bots, when, if it was a case of a rogue bot up where gone rogue, that's, that was immediately discovered, and then a whole 18 months sort of controversy over the fallout of that happened. In the cases of bots where there were sort of, it was a bug, and two bots were inadvertently fighting with each other, the bot up where got in contact with each other. Every single case that we examined, um, that we were able to find, um, Wikipedians had already sort of found it and dealt with it through their existing governance structures, which that goes to show this sort of issue about to what extent Wikipedia's governance model for governing automated software agents is a good one that should be used as a model potentially for other platforms that are struggling with these issues versus something that sort of, if, the, if, if sort of according to sort of the sort of way that the, the authors of the Even Good Bot Fight paper have talked about it, they've sort of used this as an example of why we should not use Wikipedia's model as a failure of Wikipedia's model of automation regulation. Mm -hmm. So this brings up a oh, lot of questions. Time, by the way. Oh, uh, we're, we're doing just fine. Yeah, we are uh, 10, 11, we've got okay. 40, oh, 50. Yeah. And we want to assess the type of questions too. So yeah. Yes. Um, so this brings up a lot of questions about how we use data. And I think that other people who have a quantitative background, like I do, uh, will be very interested in answering these questions because how we operationalize data is everything that we do. You know, anytime that we take a measurement, we have to know what, what it is that we're measuring. Um, and so I want to interview Stuart for a moment to ask him about these terms. This is actually something that we do quite often. Stuart will say something, I have no idea what he means, and then I'll proceed to interview him. So we're going to do a little bit of that. Um, so this is one of the, the questions that Stuart raises in the paper. Uh, how do we work with found data? What is found data? Uh, so found data is a term that sort of a lot of people have started to use to refer to data that is not originally collected for research purposes. So typically in the social sciences, traditionally, um, a lot of the sort of work is done by social scientists who collect the data themselves, you design a survey, and you run that survey, and you collect the responses. Um, and you know very well, if you've ever created a survey, you know so well the trade-offs that you have to make. You can't make a survey too long. You have to word the questions in certain ways. It's going to capture some things, but not others. And because you have made that survey instrument, you, um, you know, and you, you struggle with it, you know you are, you are better suited than probably anyone else to know the limitations of what that can, what that is and is not capturing. Same with interviews or sort of other sort of aspects. But one of the things that we sort of increasingly rely on in what's sort of the field of the thing called computational social science is data that was not originally created for research purposes, that sort of automatically archived and logged. So the entire revision history of Wikipedia is a, is a very popular source of found data. Um, our logs and uh, tweets that are archived from Twitter that you access through the API or other sort of methods, also a very popular source of data for computational social science. And one of the problems with found data is that because you often, you know, because it wasn't created for research purposes, um, it's sort of the integrity of it is not what we, we, we might sort of imagine when we're sort of the data that we do create for research purposes. So actually in the Q&A for the, 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 the last session um, uh, at, at Wikisam, I, one of the questions I sort of brought up was around um, how do things in uh, database, in sort of various uh, open collaboration systems deal with like redacting information. Wikipedia like deletes, permanently deletes things from the database all the time. We get an open source software, like history is rewritten to make uh, sort of commits, like commits are squashed together. Uh, for example, to, to code, in order to make them easier for people to deal with and to sort of um, you know, you know, follow. Um, and so the database lies to a certain extent. If you assume the database is representing the full activity of what happened. So uh, one of the things that I brought up to Stuart when we started talking about this, this idea of traces and not, not necessarily representing what you want them to, are edits to talk pages. If you're not familiar with Wikipedia, the way that people communicate on Wikipedia is by adding, adding uh, uh, paragraphs one after the other to a wiki page that's called a talk page behind <coughs> articles and that sort of stuff. Um, and so a way that a lot of times people operationalize communication in Wikipedia is by counting up the number of edits that happen to these talk pages. However, some of the edits to talk pages 
aren't communication, at least not between editors at all. They're removing templates or maybe archiving a whole section or something like that. And so if you're doing a study where you're just looking at the scale of communication, well, you know, edits to talk pages are really, really kind of good measure of that. But if you're looking at who's talking and what kind of talking they're doing, if you look at every single edit by a person as communication on a talk page, well, you'll just be wrong. A lot of those edits aren't communication. In fact, people specialize in curating talk pages, and you might find an editor who's only editing with templates. Or, for example, with the case of bots, one of the, the when, when bots edit talk pages, what what they are almost always what what they are most often doing is removing content in the sense that they are archiving it. They're moving it from because Wikipedia doesn't have sort of a modern sort of commenting sort of system, they have people have to, the bots have to sort of manually remove old discussions to sort of sub pages of, of, uh, of, of those talk pages. And so if you look at the activity of bots and you sort of even see what they're doing on a surface level, even if you sort of look at the diffs, you might sort of even imagine, oh, these bots are, are removing, they're sort of uh, actually causing a lot of damage. But if you look at the sort of broader context of what those bots are doing, it's like, oh no, it's approved to remove that. And so if you don't look at the data sort of very closely or you don't know the, the context in which that's coming from, you might make some wrong assumptions about sort of what people are sort of doing in that, in that Even space. Even good bots argue. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, let's talk about this contextualization. Like, what do you mean about the, the perils and politics of decontextualization? So context is a word, it's, 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 a, it's a word that sort of anthropologists and sort of uh, you know, we sort of love to you know, you know use in that sense, but it sort of can mean very a lot of different words, but love mean a lot of different things. But broadly speaking, sort of the sort of the broader context of where um, a sort of activity is situated, and one of the things that sort of computational systems do is they are very powerful um, in that they can so removing context lets us compare things at scale. Um, in a sense, but you have to do that, but you have to sort of remove things from their original context in order to sort of compare them. And so what I talk about sort of the perils of, of decontextualization is when you take an event outside of the original sort of space in which it was created. Um, and as it's work for research, we, we sort of do this in order to make things sort of comparable. Um, we have to sort of, if we, if, you know, we can't sort of see the full picture of everything all the time. And any statistical analysis we run sort of removes information, it removes context. Um, I think we're the, sort of the great, was it, um, so the phrase that sort of all models are wrong, but some are useful, mm -hmm. um, in that sense, right? That uh, there was a statistician, sort of uh, George Box, I think, sort of, and you know who sort of said that, and I think it's a really important sort of thing to keep in mind um, that every sort of macro level, the more macro level claims that we can make, sort of always come at the cost of specificity, and we have to sort of think about what are even the politics of, you know, what are the implications of certain ways in which we abstract, you know, what for what, you know, what are we sort of keeping when we go to that macro level view. Um, and sort of what are we not keeping? Right, like so when you design your own survey or you design your set of interviews, you are necessarily encoding the context in the data that you collect. Um, but when you maybe find data, then you, you have to do a lot of work to figure out what context did that data exist in so that you can interpret that found data correctly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the real risk, right, is not in, I'm not, not sort of a, a, a critic of of you know, large scale qual you know, quantitative research, obviously, but I think it's really important to sort of check our assumptions and the perils of found mm -hmm. data is that we don't often sort of keep that in mind in the way it's sort of, it's sort of incredibly easy for us to sort of do work without sort of keeping that in mind. Mm -hmm. All right, so cooking data with care. Um, and this, this word veridical, what, what does that mean? Yeah, so cooking data with care, this is a quote um, that comes from uh, Jeff Bowker. Um, who, along with sort of Susan Lee Starr, wrote sort of a really seminal sort of piece called "Sorting Things Out," um, which was about classification, but also is about sort of a sort of really interesting sort of approach to studying sort of information systems. This is a really good example, by the way, of a book that I wouldn't read unless I hang out with Stuart because he likes to talk about sorting things out. <laughs> and so Bowker talks about uh, cooking as a great metaphor for data analysis, and so did a lot of work sort of studying scientific practice. And sort of cooking, originally, if you sort of cooked your data in the sort of normal way that we talk about it, that's sort of a sign of that, that people mean sort of scientific misconduct, right? To cook your data in the way we normally talk about it means to sort of fabricate it or to sort of remove outliers or to sort of manipulate it in ways that sort of we don't consider to be you know, scientifically acceptable. <coughs> but um, he, like, he says it's actually sort of the metaphor of cooking, of, of ingredients, of being a chef, of having sort of a stage, a pipeline of things 
of transformations that you make along a sort of set of things is actually a really great and sort of generative and constructive way to think about data analysis, to think about yourself as a chef, a scientist as sort of a chef with a whole sort of kitchen apparatus that takes in ingredients. Sometimes you know the provenance of ingredients really well, sometimes you don't, and that maybe changes how you cook them. If you don't know where that meat comes from, you might have to cook it to a really high temperature. If it's really high quality sushi, you can serve it raw. So, uh, like maybe we should, instead of calling it cooking your data, we should call it poisoning your data, and maybe <laughs> instead you should cook it so that people can eat it and not die. Yeah. And so vertical versus representational, um, this is also something that comes from, uh, this is actually, th those words I'm taking from Susan Lee Starr, her piece of the ethnography of infrastructure. Um, you know, she talks about vertical is a way of understanding data where you unproblematically take data to be representations of reality, of the thing that you're studying. And representational, you take data to be representations of a social process. And I think a really good example of this, sort of this is a debate we get into deeply in social science around humans and things can get messy, but actually the example that sort of Kevin showed last, uh, last, in the last keynote this morning about the particle accelerator um, from uh, you know, the having to sort of filter out human data from like the noise that's coming from um, you know, trucks that are sort of going by shows this really well. That actually, it, even oh, yeah, wasn't this the uh, the gravity? Oh, the gravity, detector? the gravity detector. Yeah. yeah. Like, is this is this a laser misalignment? Is this is this a wave crashing on the shore? Is it is it? And and who are the people who are judging these these graphs, these these uh, visualizations? You know, that's part of the process of cooking the data. And so, you know, scientists sort of know sort of very well and often implicitly, but you know that. Um, they have to that 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 what is coming in when you sort of are studying something sort of in the physical world, um, you know, it's what is coming in is a series of sort of abstract representations of something that we then take to understand to be something in the physical world. Um, but uh, but there is a socio-technical system that is involved in any sort of scientific study, even sort of in the physical sciences, where those sensors that are coming in sort of have to be calibrated and they have to be maintained and they have to be checked. And there's sort of armies of graduate students and technicians that are sort of involved in keeping the integrity of that. And so what's actually being collected and taken to be a representation of the physical world um, is sort of a set of traces of activities that are sort of done by humans. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I want to kind of uh, sum up like what all this means because we've been getting very theoretical for a little bit. And I, I, I love to do this to make sure that I understand what Stuart is talking about. And really, I think what we're trying to say about the, the paper that we're critiquing, this Even Good Bots Fight paper, is that nothing was wrong with their statistical approach. They, they actually did a pretty good job when it came to data analysis. I think that their analyses are actually quite interesting. But the interpretation was the problem. They approached their data as just having a meaning, uh, assuming that they weren't assuming anything about the data at all. And they drew these very wide-reaching conclusions and and uh, disseminated those conclusions through the news media, and uh, you know conclusions that are arguably wrong. Um, but there was nothing really wrong with their data analysis. They did a they did a good job with that. Yeah, and so there are a massive number of bot bot reverts that occur, and the title of their paper, "Even Good Bots Fight," is correct. There are even good bots do fight. We did find a very small fraction of cases. But I think that where, where, where we, we did consider them to be, depending uh, in, in all the different ways we, we talk about operationalizing conflict between bots, um, there are still sort of cases that we find sort of with that. However, um, we really struggled over this in order to sort of, and we sort of, this is sort of also in conversation with other sort of issues that are sort of exploding, I think, in science right now around the replication crisis um, and other sort of issues around scientific validity. There's a lot of, like, we don't consider this to be, we, the, 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 the terms that we have for talking about this don't really sort of apply. Like we're, we're not, for example, we're not, we've never called for a retraction of that original paper, and we do not think that that is appropriate. Um, we think that they, the statistical findings that they created found something that was real in the world. But the problem is sort of with the interpretation, with the sort of the, the discussion section, right? The, the hardest section of the paper to write, as you know, we, we also sort of heard in that sense. And so it's about sort of the proper operationalization of concepts and the interpretation of what your data means. And so this is something that we've sort of gone back and forth with sort of a lot of people on what do we call this and how do we sort of think about this in the scientific process and how do we build spaces and you know, in our academic systems for this kind of work to flourish, for, for, for the kind of work that is maybe the, the careful, thoughtful, and honestly, like, it's very tedious. Like, the paper is incredibly long and gets into detail. <laughs> it's incredibly tedious work 
uh, in boring work, it's it's not sexy at all. It's not it hasn't you know to do that. Oh yeah. All right. Well, actually, there 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 is one more point that I want to make about this. You know, like and Stuart Stuart put it pretty well a moment ago. Good bots do fight, but it's rare and it's short lived. And the government system the governance system mostly works. You know, their statistics showed that good bots fight and they're not wrong, but their conclusion was way out of whack. And that's the hazard that we run when we don't cook our data with care, when we make assumptions but we don't acknowledge them, when we don't spend some time contextualizing the trace data that we use in the analyses that we do. Um, and so I, I wanted to pull this up. This is actually from an article in Wikipedia, uh, The Bullshit Asymmetry Principle, from El Alberto Randolini. Uh, the amount of energy needed to refute, bu refute bullshit is an order of magnitude bigger than to produce it. And so when we look at the Even Good Bots Fight paper, it was 13 pages and about 6,500 words. And our response to that paper was 33 pages and about 21,000 words. And we, we had to spend so much time, like if you're actually going to dig into a piece of data and contextualize it, I think we spent at least a page explaining what a double redirect is and why you would have bots <laughs> help clean up double redirects or what an interwiki link is and why an interwiki link that changes uh, in 2003 and then changes again in 2006 is maybe not conflict. Um, describing what conflict actually is takes a lot of words. We had to do a whole bunch of secondary analyses, a whole bunch of statistics, um, and actually a whole bunch of things that didn't even make it in the final paper. We have um, a lot of all of our analyses of the, the code and data, including um, our analyses and interpretations in Jupyter Notebooks or up on GitHub, um, and there's a lot of things that sort of, we did a lot of secondary analyses, just sort of running different sort of metrics on these to sort of say, well, if we assume this, we might expect that. Oh, we see this, we don't see that, and sort of our sort of process of sort of working through that. This took, you know, a long time to sort of do, and I think took longer than maybe the original sort of creation of that, um, that sort of work. Right. And I think one of the things is we likely would not have been able to get this paper accepted um, with the sort of findings where the deep and careful consideration of what constitutes bot, co bot, bot conflict and the many different ways you can define conflict and quantitatively operationalize it, um, we probably couldn't have gotten the 21,000 word paper into the proceedings of CSCW had it we not been sort of responding to a previous work. Um, because that level of detail and that level of honestly is sort of not the norm in computational social science, uh, which I think is actually sort of a, a, a real shame in the sense of, I think one of the things that we've sort of also talked a lot about is sort of the, you know, incentive structures that sort of are, are, are at play with the way that, you know, we often sort of think about academic research um, and the way that sort of we reward it and the structures were sort of encouraged to sort of wrap our publications up into sort of minimum publishable units um, and sort of push them out sort of as quickly as possible, get as many publications, um, and sort of make those sort of metrics in order to sort of advance in our careers. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's something where the, the long-term impact of sort of you know, work that sort of is careful and judicious and slow, and maybe, and this sort of took, we, we, we could have sort of pumped out a whole bunch of papers instead of pumping out this one paper and sort of taking the time. We did it because we felt it was important, and I think we're maybe lucky to be in positions where um, our respective employers were either able to sort of, you know, I'm actually really grateful to the Berkeley Institute for Data Science for letting me spend a lot of the time on this. Don't um, tell the Wikimedia Foundation that I spent so much time on this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I think also we want this to be used. We also put a lot of care and time into this because we um, and made our, our data, our analyses, and sort of our code available sort of very publicly and openly because we also want this to be something that others can look through and look through as a model. Um, and thinking about if you are, if there's sort of a really fuzzy, messy social concept that can mean many different things like conflict, and you want to think about how to sort of operationalize that well, we're hoping that sort of longer, more in-depth, slower papers are something that become sort of rewarded uh, in the, in, as opposed to sort of a lot of the current sort of systems that we have set up for rewarding research. Right. So, um, we, uh, oh, yeah. Stuart really <laughs> wanted to, to finish on this. What is this that we're looking at? So we're looking at, so one of the, this is the uh, first volume of the Transactions of the Royal Society, <laughs> arguably the first science, peer-reviewed scientific journal. And I want to sort of close on this because I, you know, we've had a lot of sort of, you know, talk back and forth about sort of the, the way that we want to approach this and the way that we sort of wanted to sort of write, this is the first like, re like reputation paper that I think uh, that I've been involved in, I think you have as well. Um, very anxiety provoking sort of for me and sort of actually made me sort of think we sort of talked a lot about what it means to be a scientific researcher, what it means to be an academic, sort of what it means to sort of what kind of relationships we should have 
with sort of people that, you know, we don't want to, like, I don't sort of want to be a bully. I don't want to be a method sniper in that sort of sense. I want to sort of approach these things, you know, with care and concern and as part of a sort of academic community that sort of comes together in order to help sort of, you know, you know stand on each other's shoulders and stand on the shoulders of giants and to, um, you know, build on each other's research. And what I want to say is that the debating, uh, this is also one of the reasons why we sort of haven't called for a retraction of even good bots fight or even sort of a notice on that, is that I want this to be part of the, con I think this is a good point, that it should be part of the conduct of scientific research, that all the time we should be, you know, you know debating each other's findings in ways that, you know, aren't confrontational, but it's sort of, sort of saying, you define this in one way, your metric was sort of using it this way, your scale, you used you know, social psychologists debate all the time about how to word their survey questions. And when you word things differently, you know, there's an entire subfield of social psychology that like really gets into this. Um, and I think that a lot of the sort of things around the replication crisis have sort of presented these things as very antagonistic and very conflict driven and you know, that sort of these, you know, you know, getting into sort of, we want to sort of pick fights with each other. And that's not the model of science that sort of I, I sort of support. And I sort of think that this sort of work of sort of going in and sort of checking each other's assumptions, going in should be considered to be sort of, um, you know, more of a sort of form of, it's a, I think it's actually a form of collaboration. It's a form of mediated asynchronous collaboration. We wouldn't have written our paper without that original Even Good Bots Fight paper having been published. You know, and I, I, I think like this, this point, I, I've heard it made a lot of times before, you know, in various keynotes across various conferences, um, that we should look a lot more towards replication studies, that we should write more rebuttal papers. It's hard to get them through review. It's hard to get a paper through review that says, hey, we looked at what this study did, and it turns out that we got the same results. And uh, I, I, I'll say now, like, I review a lot for OpenSim, I review a lot for CCW, for CHI, and for a few other journals. And if you do a, a replication study and you find that either you find the same results of past work or you find different results from past work, I think that's interesting. And I will vote to uh, accept that paper. I think it's important and I, I'll stand up for it. Because sometimes, right, sometimes you do a study and you, know, you might actually also find something that's not interesting, right? You can have a hypothesis that you come in. I don't think all of our findings also need to be flashy and newsworthy and sort of have sort of the compelling titles in order to get rewarded. Honestly, like whenever, you know, the, the kinds of, when you run a study, you have a hypothesis and sometimes it might sort of pan out to something that's sort of really interesting and sexy and, you know, attention grabbing. And sometimes it might turn out that, you know, well, your hypothesis, it doesn't actually work that way and the world is as boring and as predictable as we originally thought it was. And I think that those papers, no matter what the outcome of that, should be rewarded equally. And it's sort of a lottery if you win, the, if, you know, that, that you sort of win, if you sort of stumble, if you do a sort of project and you stumble upon one that happens to be a finding that sort of co contradicts the, the sort of an existing theory or sort of says something really interesting and surprising that we didn't expect. Um, and in fact, actually, if you get a sort of string of those um, in your, in, you know, I, I don't think that we should be sort of be using that in terms of understanding sort of what it means to do good research. I think that, um, and I think things actually, I don't think, pre-registration of sort of results is something that's been proposed a lot in social psychology. Um, and I'm not sure if that's sort of the solution to it, but the idea that sort of you should sort of get equal credit no matter how, you know, whether your finding is sort of overturning something existing or sort of reinforcing it. Um, you know, there's a lot of sort of issues that sort of take place um, where a lot of sort of people sort of won't, a lot of journals and top tier journals in particular, won't publish findings um, unless they are uh, sort of novel and overturning existing results, which biases um, the actual sort of understandings that we sort of have if you only read those sort of, you know, papers coming from those venues. Right, you know, I, I, I really wonder how many, how many studies from OpenSim, for example, have been replicated, but people just felt like they, they wouldn't get any credit for publishing something like that. We don't know what our most ro robust results are. Other fields do this much better than we do. Mm -hmm. You know, in medicine, you know, nothing is really accepted until it's been replicated several times by independent research labs. You know, we don't really do that. And so we don't know what are our robust results and what results are on shaky ground. You know, and that means like, you don't even know what replication papers you should do because you don't know what's robust and what's not. Okay, so actually I think, well at the screen, I think actually that's sort of all we sort of had. We'd love to sort of open it up to questions and sort of talk about any number of the issues that we've been uh, sort of wrestling with. So thank you very much. David. So, uh, Dave McDonald, University of Washington. 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you've certainly given a lot of comments to, um, to think about and prompt some thoughts. And uh, maybe just one to have you kind of like react to, I suppose, is um, you've been rather charitable to the Even Good Box Spike paper, the original paper. And what I might then query is you, you kind of make a claim that um, sort of their results are statistically valid. And then you also mention that the operationalization was somehow subtly flawed. Isn't the review process, a peer review process, supposed to identify when you've misoperationalized variables such that then a result won't be interpreted as correct? Because that's what's known as, and a philosopher should know this, is a classic modus ponens flaw, which is you cannot get to a correct result from a false premise. And that's what that operationalization is, I would claim. So, so maybe the paper actually should be retracted because intellectually it actually is deeply flawed because of the operationalization error. I mean, isn't that maybe a fair assumption? Um, so, so I want to take on the yeah, review yeah, yeah, part, yeah, yeah. and maybe you can take on the retraction part. So I, I think you're absolutely right. I would love to have seen this get caught in review. And honestly, when I, when I first saw the preprint, I was like, oh, this isn't going to make it through review. Right, um, yeah, sorry, it was published. What was that? It was published in right. PLOS One. Yeah, it was published in we PLOS One. If, if you submit a paper on bots and Wikipedia to OpenSAM to CACW to CAI to ICWSM, we'll get that paper. Yeah. You like or, or, you know, there are other <laughs> researchers that, that are familiar with the literature and, and at least know a thing or two about operationalizing bot activities um, who will review that and probably won't let it through review. I think that PLOS One is, well, I, well, I really value PLOS One's commitment to open access. I, I just don't think that their their review process will pull in people who can adequately critique operationalization. I think that they, they instead focus on pulling people in who can critique uh, analytics methods. Well, and they, they have a very specific review policy, which is if the paper is correct, they will publish it. Not if the paper is significant, important, makes a contribution, those are not right. review criteria. But it's interesting that the point that David made is that the paper isn't correct. Um, and this, that operationalization of data is, as we are arguing, is equally important as uh, correct statistics. Right. But they don't see that as part of the correctness algorithm, or maybe they just raise their hands and say, we can't deal with that, so we're just not going to. So this is, yeah, and I'll, I'll, also briefly on the reviewing thing too, um, I do this all the time in, in, in reviews, and I actually like take a lot of my reviews with care and maybe sort of review less than I can, but some, a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of times when I do my reviews, those of you who have been ACs for me, those that, some, that sometimes like send you like 1,500 to 2,000 word reviews, <laughs> or like long, long, long reviews. I sometimes write papers in my reviews. Um, and I all the time come in cases where someone has found something and they have interpreted, they have operationalized it in one way, I don't, then I'm like, well actually, what, what, what you're actually measuring is this. You think that what you're measuring is, is X, but actually it's Y. I, a lot of the time I spend in reviewing um, is that um, to a certain extent, and I think that. But I think the problem with that is, I found that it takes so much work in the reviewing process to do that. It takes also it takes expertise in, in the in the subject matter. That's not, I think, actually the bigger issue. The bigger issue is that I kind of feel that by the time I've done that, I have made like a co-author worthy contribution. <laughs> um, in that sense, of, right? And and I'm often sort of struggling with that and how to sort of think about that as part of the review process. And and there actually have been some times where I have been, been like, you know, worked with some people before, but I think that getting, um, yeah, so I think that's something that we should sort of be thinking about, about how we sort of consider reviewing and, and to what extent someone with a substantial amount of like subject matter expertise sort of, you know, steering someone in that direction. It's, it's different than saying, I don't think that your statistical test you shouldn't have used the t-test for this because it's the wrong assumption. You know, it's a different, it's a very different kind of sort of work in reviewing, and it does put a lot of burden on reviewers with extensive subject matter expertise to sort of then demonstrate that both to the authors and to the other reviewers and ACs. On the, I, I want to then respond to sort of the other sort of aspect of that, and us being sort of too charitable. Um, I'm also sort of mindful of like my positionality as a sort of non-faculty and a junior scholar. Um, you know, publicly rebutting works from professors at Oxford. Um, that's something that you know I'll just not say more on that, but that's something that gives me a substantial amount of anxiety around this. But I also think that it's important to have 
a, that's not the only reason why I am sort of hesitant to sort of go on the full warpath on this. I also think that it's important to make space. So I, I, I come from the Wikipedia community. I've been an editor since 2004. Right, and I understand, and I think that the, one of the norms and the values that I think is really sort of powerful about Wikipedia is the sort of model of sort of assuming good faith and iteratively, like you know, working um, to sort of make things better. Um, and I think that it's important in sort of to be bold and then revert and discuss. Right, is also one of the sort of things. And I think it's important to have a space for people to put out a statistical analysis and put out their interpretation of it. And if their assumptions are wrong. If, they, if, if someone commits scientific misconduct, right? If someone fabricates de data, if someone, you know, that should be, you know, that should be punished, right? We should not have people in science who fabricate, fabricate data. Or, you know, who sort of, you know, there's also sort of concerns about p-hacking or things like this. I think this is a very different kind of thing. And our current sort of system, I, I take sort of, you know, started in philosophy, but now I'm in science and technology studies, and I see science as a socio-technical system. Retractions mean something in our socio-technical system. Retractions mean basically almost scientific misconduct has been created. And so I think in that system, calling for retraction means attributing scientific misconduct. And that's not something that I sort of want to do. And I think it's important to have a space where we, and particularly often like junior scholars, can come in, run a statistical analysis, and then have an, have an interpretation of those results that is based on their best assumptions at the time. And that's you know the way you know if I'm terrified of someone you know coming in for all of my papers right and doing that, but I think that just like sort of Wikipedians are sort of open to each other, kind of I don't want to get to the point where sort of we become so antagonistic around that 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 is a, that has a chilling effect on the kinds of sort of work we can do. Um, I think it's, it should, we should have something where you can you can come in and have an interpretation, and the discussion section is taken as maybe more provisional. Um, and then other people can, you know, passionately debate that that sort of section, and that not being seen as something bad, but seen as something that is part of the scientific process. For me, retractions, I think they're interpreted as this did not follow our understanding of the scientific practice. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I, I guess I just want to add that, you know, like I, I think the uh, operationalization of data is in in a lot of ways subjective, and I want it to be part of the conversation. I want. I want this paper to be in the historical records that we can continue to talk about it. I don't want it to disappear. Um, I think that it's important, and in fact, I would encourage uh, you all in classes with students when you're talking about operationalization, I feel like putting these two papers next to each other is a great opportunity to continue that conversation. Um, it's, it's okay to be wrong in science. In fact, it's part of the scientific process. Poisoning your data is one thing, but being wrong is something totally different. There and then there. Thank you very much. I wonder if... Um, Where are you? Oh, uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Chris from the uh, University of Leeds. Uh, I wonder if you have any thoughts about what the implications of this episode might be for um, studies of bots in other online <coughs> communities, um, whether whether you know contextualizing those same kinds of uh, you know practices might 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 be um, illuminating. Yeah, so I think that this has been one of the things where I also felt it was important to write the paper because the Even Good Bots Fight paper. I sp I've been spending a lot of time recently in a lot of these sort of. Um, more sort of policy law and sort of you know, you know public policy sort of spaces around sort of get the governance of sort of AI and machine learning, um, which are conversations that are happening more on the sort of corporate uh, social media platforms. And this paper has been used, has been brought up multiple times in those conversations as sort of evidence for a very hard line like top down approach, um, you know that that um, you know you know towards bots. Um, and I actually spend a lot of time with bots on Twitter. I run a, I run a number of bots on Twitter that are sort of just weird sort of things. And I'm sort of in contact on a lot of, with a lot of the sort of the art bot sort of community on Twitter, um, who is actually about to die at the moment because of new uh, API restrictions that Twitter is making in order to clamp down on bots for misinformation and sort of that whole sort of aspect of that. And I haven't seen, and sort of in these policy forums and I've been in these conversations about the governance of AI, I'm sort of the one who like stands on the chair and like yells about, hey, Wikipedia has been struggling with and thinking about how to sort of work with automated agents since before Mark Zuckerberg enrolled in college. You know, and it was, you know, the first Wikipedia bot sort of come in basically at the end of 2001, early 2002, at the founding of the project, um, which is, you know, 
and it was immediately sort of controversial uh, and you know prompted a whole lot of initial policy discussions about Wikipedia. And I think that that idea that automation can be a way of understanding like where we are and sort of a, a sort of a mode of public policy creation in ourselves is something that I haven't seen as part of that conversation at all. And so I've been trying to sort of in, in, include that in a lot of those other sort of conversations. Now that said, I don't think that the Wikipedia model can be sort of one-to-one -one transposed into something that works at the scale of Twitter. Um, the Wikipedia model is actually very intensive. It involves a lot of discussion, involves a lot of negotiation. Policy in Wikipedia, in fact, involves a lot of negotiation and discussion, and the policy environment and is in Wikipedia is so much more complex than the policy structure at Facebook or, um, or, or Twitter. Um, and I don't know to what extent like, people are actually willing to put in that time. If we scaled it, I think I did some back of the envelope calculations that basically like the, the number of sort of alleged bots that, Wikipedia, that sort of Twitter has um, would require like you know more labor hours than um, all of the existing like Twitter staff has like put together. You know, one thing that I would note, though, is that there there's some really key takeaways that you can take from Wikipedia. The reason why bot fights are uncommon and short-lived when they do happen is that bot activities are in the public. It's not just the governance system regulating when a bot gets to run. It's also how bots are observed after they start to run. On Wikipedia, there's recent changes, um, and a lot of people do look at bot activity and recent changes. Uh, if a bot edits a page on your watch list, a page that you're interested in, you're going to see its activity. And if you think that that bot might be going haywire, it's really easy to go look through that bot's history and see if it seems to be interacting with another bot. And uh, just having those sort of like peer governance uh, mechanisms in place might be able to at least mitigate the uh, centralized labor hours cost of trying to track and regulate bots from maybe a team at Twitter or something like that. Maybe not the solution that Twitter or Facebook need, but it's something that they should really seriously consider because it seems to work for Wikipedia and it works surprisingly well. Um, oh, so there was there. Uh, Olivier from uh, Tech and Safaris. I'm very surprised because you described bots, fighting bots, and uh, in a certain way we could publish an article on BBC or something about uh, researchers fighting researchers <laughs> on that refuga uh, refutation uh, debate. And uh, uh, I'm wondering what, uh, what are the lessons for the infrastructure of academic publishing and reviewing and being in open collaboration, the news uh, and, and wikis. I, I think what, what would be the, the, the evolution that, we, that you could suggest for, for the whole academic process in this field? So let me go first, I'll let you talk about news uh, in a second. So I did reach out, so, so like I said, Stuart and I get contacted relatively frequently by news media outlets to talk about robots for various reasons. Um, and so I have some contacts, um, not just the people who reached out to us for, for uh, the Even Good Bots Fight study, but for other, for other uh, publications about our work. Um, no one's interested in a paper that says that, ah, I guess actually the bots aren't fighting each other in Wikipedia. And they weren't very interested in writing an article about uh, science getting itself right, you know, like the conversation moving forward. It's just not that exciting. Um, and I try it hard. And, you know, I have a little bit of social capital with these folks, and it still didn't pay out. I still was not able to get them to move forward with any of this. And I think the kinds of things that would then make it, I'm thinking there was a, a great New York Times Magazine sort of piece on the case around um, um, Amy Cuddy, who did a lot of social psycholo psychology work on the power poses sort of study. And the sort of thing that made that into the mainstream media was um, a lot of what I would also consider like gross violations of scientific norms. And it sort of became about um, things about like harassment of re like researchers harassing each other and that. I don't want this to get to a point where that's the thing that gets us into the mainstream media, right? Like that's not, that like, and I also think at a broader level, we have a real problem with how we rely on mainstream media and to a certain extent social media, but actually I think more we rely more on mainstream media as a way to manage our own information overload problem with the massive number of research papers that, that come out. Um, Wikipedia and academia have the same information overload problem of having to sort of review and keep track of all the changes and all the updates that are sort of happening. There are more papers published than sort of we can all read um, and keep up with. And so we do end up inadvertently sort of relying on um, the news media to select what sort of studies get sort of highlighted. And I think there's a real danger with that. 
Um, and I think that actually sort of, you know, Wikipedia might be an interesting example when thinking about like looking at how they have sort of thought about the information overload problem and the sort of the way that sort of reviewing is 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 sort of done. I don't think, of course, it's a one-to-one -one sort of solution, but um, I do think that we should be sort of very careful about. Uh, I mean, the way that academia sort of works, the way science sort of works, is through a reputation economy in terms of sort of who sort of gets. So whose work sort of gets highlighted and whose work gets cited and whose work gets distributed is sort of taken to uh, stand, it's, it's a way in which sort of academic institutions operationalize, um, you know, the quality of their researchers is based on sort of a whole set of proxy metrics. Um, and even a lot of the things in the alt metrics movement um, that are coming in, I think also are sort of rethinking how we operationalize the quality of research and researchers. But also, I think we need to think very carefully about the role that we place on you know, things that spread, things that go viral on social media or things that are picked up by the mainstream media, um, this is a biased way of sort of spreading research. And it is biased towards sort of sensationalist findings. It's biased towards very simple findings that sort of collapse a lot of context, uh, you know, complicated things into a sort of compelling story. Something that takes like, you know, 20,000 20, words to slog through. And the conclusion is even that, well, it depends on how you measure it. Um, you know, is a lot harder of a story to sort of make go viral um, than sort of things that I think are actually, you know, the, the shorter stories, the simpler stories, the ones that are sort of, um, you know, compelling because they overturn sort of maybe a commonly held sort of, you know, belief. Um, you know, those, that's not, I don't think that's what we should be sort of selecting on. Right, so my advice to young graduate students or anybody who is new to publishing, try and get yourself in the news media because it's going to pay off for you. But my advice to the field is we got to stop taking the news media so seriously uh, because it's it's not doing well for our research. So uh, just a quick comment and then an actual question. The, uh, the quick comment is um, there's a nice paper called That's Interesting that in fact defines interestingness as uh, contradicting weekly held beliefs. Mm. Um, and part, part of the reason why that works is because uh, well, you should read the paper anyway. There's a nice two by two that goes along with it, and you know, interesting is contradicting weekly held beliefs. Um, the comment, though, or the, it's not so much a question as to, to re, uh, divert the discussion back to the point you were making about uh, the perils of analyzing uh, found data. Mm -hmm. This is something which uh, I've been writing about for a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think it actually goes beyond the two categories you had, you know, the data represent reality or the data our, our interpretation, uh, they're actually manufactured. Um, and the system that manufactures them is in fact uh, itself an artifact. And that, that you can actually think about the data not coming from the people or their processes, but that in fact the interaction of the people and the processes with some kind of data collection technology. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I have a paper which is currently under review, hopefully comes out soon, um, in which we used uh, work by Karen Berard on, um, uh, what was it called? Help me out here. The, so not reflection, but Oh, uh, refraction, refraction. Right, so the idea that, that, that the, the phenomena only happens because people are interacting with the system. So, so I think Wikipedia is a nice example of that, right? <coughs> Wikipedia edits are not a natural phenomena. They happen because people are interacting with the technology of uh, the wiki, uh, of Wikipedia. And the way they happen is governed by that entire system. And so, so not only do people's behavior change when you start to mess around with the system, but you know what the data actually needs to start to change. Mm -hmm. And so taking that much more holistic perspective of not just saying, oh, well, we have a pile of data, we can analyze it, but, but actually saying the data come from a practice, but, but not just any practice, it's a practice of interacting with the data collection system. Right. You know, I have a, I have a good story about this. So uh, at the Wikimedia Foundation, we measure a ton of things in order to figure out where we're going to invest our resources and that sort of stuff. One of the things that you might have noticed is that uh, if you log into Wikipedia right now, uh, you should have, uh, um, gosh, I forget what we call it, uh, but it used to be called uh, pop-ups or pop-overs <laughs> as a gadget, and we've now formalized it as a tool, where if you hover over a link, it'll give you a little card that shows you where you will go if you click on that link. If that article has an image, it'll show the little image, and it'll show maybe the first couple sentences of the lead of that article. 
Um, it turns out that when we first deployed that, um, our page views went down. And so our measurement of page views as engagement with Wikipedia changed meaning. And uh, we, we almost decided to not deploy that. In fact, shut down that project because it was reducing engagement with Wikipedia. Obviously, it wasn't reducing engagement with Wikipedia. It turns out engagement now included viewing a page or viewing a little pop-up card. Um, and we had to incorporate that into how we thought about measuring engagement in order to realize that actually, yes, this is a good thing that people are using and we shouldn't stop doing it. Yeah, and I think that's a, that's a really, I totally agree with that, uh, what you're saying, and that's, I love that story too, because I think it also talks about the damage. Going back to the question earlier about what social media platforms, uh, others can learn from these cases, um, the dangers of the, the KPIs, the key performance indicators, um, which are a standard practice in industry, for you define a particular metric and then success within the organization and the goals of any team in the organization are pegged to whether they make those key performance indicators rise or decline. Um, and if you don't, I think one thing sort of a lot of the social media sites are struggling with a lot um, are things like misinformation, hate speech, civility. They're sort of defining metrics around this and then trying to sort of peg all of their sort of work to those metrics. And the thing is also like these systems are so, I think, Social media sites are so different than so others because of um, the other sort of technological systems in that users change them so much by engaging with them. I think mm -hmm. templates in Wikipedia are probably one of the biggest examples of this. Mm -hmm. And how, and, and if you're, you're a Wikipedia researcher, how to work with templates well is a well-known thorny problem that you might have struggled with. How to detect them and sort of how Wikipedians use them as traces, but how they also change them from time to time again. And doing any historical research on Wikipedia from 2001 to 2018 is very, very difficult because it's fundamentally changed so much since then, but kept the same database model. And so there is a belief, that actually, I think we know not to trust anything in the database since before 2004, yeah. but even if we do... Or 2008, depending on what you're doing. Or 2011, depending on other things, right? <laughs> and it's, it's one of those things that, because, but because it's presented in a database, that purports to show a long-term record, a continuous record, we assume that that is comparable. Um, and that's something that's very sort of hard to sort of work with and deal with, but it's incredibly important. And I don't think that computational social science, and I know that machine learning as a sort of field, often does not place as nearly as much emphasis in understanding how data is created and how that impacts the findings that you can make. Often it's sort of starting from the set of data that we find what statistical analyses do we then do? The aspect before is something that you know we don't often sort of teach or focus, uh, you know, hardly as much effort on. Are we right. on time? So I got the time symbol just a moment ago, and so I want to I want to just uh, conclude with with a couple notes, and maybe give Stuart time if he wants to do the same. So note number one is that if you're if you're a quant focused researcher, I don't want to scare you away from doing your analyses. I, I think that you, you should use your statistical methods and big data analysis to dig into how people behave in online systems like Wikipedia or Wikidata or Wikia or uh, OpenStreetMap or anything that we study in this sort of uh, set of field sites that we'd like to talk about here. Um, I think that you can get really far from spot checking your data. Run your analysis, take a random sample of things that, that look interesting and go look at those examples, go dig through the actual site. Uh, and see how those examples actually play out. You won't necessarily get the, the context that you need in order to understand it right away, but if you're really skeptical and you, you are open to disbelieving your result, you'll know if something's funny. And I want, you to, I want you to follow that intuition. If something doesn't look quite like the way that you want to operationalize the data, keep looking, keep trying to understand it. Um, and finally, uh, reach out to us if you're trying to operationalize this data. You know, uh, it, it's great if you get to us before the review process. Like Seward said, I would love to work with you on the, these kind of papers. We've been looking at this stuff for so long that if I don't know how to operationalize the thing that you want to look at, I might know somebody who actually has been working in that space for a while and does know how to operationalize it. And if I can't find anybody and I don't know how to do it, then you might be able to write a paper just about how to operationalize that and I can, I can talk to you about why that would be interesting. And so you wouldn't be wasting your time to build up that context. So yeah, contact Wikipedians too. Wikipedians love to tell you you're wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, put your research findings preliminary up on Meta 
And you know, there's a whole sort of set, whole page for that, right? Yeah, get in contact with some of the people who um, are represented in your data, and sort of ask them if it makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, that, yeah, it's a very. I think that's also something you should be sort of working towards. So, all right, thank you very much. So we can keep on discussing the smart and the appropriate rooms.